Hey everyone, this is Cameron Bowen, Tim from Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Ariel Horn, D, 5, 0. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome back friend of the show, Ariel Horn. Ariel is a contributing writer for the fan-run news and review site, youngjustice.tv, as well as the co-founder of the she fan site, Princesses of Power. Outside of her online television journalism, Ariel is also a talented fan fiction author and aspiring screenwriter, and we are so excited to have her on the show again. Ariel, I am so happy to welcome you back to Whelmed. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be back. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons so far, the comics, the video game, and even the audio play. So if you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, and we covered a few more things the last time you were here, Uh, but you've done a lot since the last time you were here. (laughs) So could you tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a freelance entertainment writer, which basically means I get to act as a professional fangirl and write about the shows I love to watch. So this started with Young Justice TV right as season three started in January of 2019, I believe. And then after season three ended, uh, I was asked to continue with the team and cover the new Harley Quinn series. Uh, Around the same time that that happened, uh, Melissa, who is also known as YJ FanVids, uh, we were really into She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. It was like our ride and die show. And we noticed that while the online fandom was massive, there was a lack of a big fandom news outlet, like what Young Justice has with the Young Justice Wiki. You know, they have like this really big presence and we're like, why doesn't Shira have that? Like they have the official Shira account, which granted like Young Justice still doesn't have, (laughs) Uh, but we're like, you know, they need like a really big like presence in the fandom and like, let's do that. So I reached out to Eric, who runs all our sites. He runs YJTV, he runs Harley Cube TV, and now DCTV.news. And I was like, can we please run a she website? I will like write everything for it. And he was like, I don't know if that's really our thing. And I was like, gosh darn it. And I'm like, OK, you know what? We're doing this ourselves. So we took our combined experience, and then we just really did. We opened up our own news site for it, which is called uh, Princesses of Power. And we've been running it since September 2019, right before season four of Shira aired. And it's been a really wild ride, like watching it grow from like a teeny tiny fandom account into like this really big outlet that's like known in the fandom. It's crazy. So how did that happen? How did you grow from such a tiny account? Is there any sort of story behind all that? Or did it just Yeah, it's actually... <laughs> It uh, It's a really funny story, which is both natural and just divine coincidence. Oh, do um, tell. So for, do tell. <laughs> I will. So for the most part, uh, during the first few months that we were growing the site, we had a really difficult time establishing ourselves in such a tight-knit community because people on Shira Twitter are, like, intense. They have been there since, like, the <laughs> beginning. And, like, if you thought, like, Young Justice, like, was devoted and, like, is such a passionate fandom, like, Shira, like, does not even come close. They are, like, leagues ahead of that. They are amazing <laughs> and incredible. Uh, so they've been there forever. And, you know, here we are, this little tiny new site, like, popping in, like, hey, guys, here we are. <laughs> come follow our website. And, you know, so it was uh, really slow going the first few months. And then, you know, Melissa and I, we're both really ambitious people. And we're like, this isn't becoming as fast as we want to. So we brought on some additional writers. We got some really incredible people that are still with us today. We have a gem who is amazing. They do a lot of art for us and they used to write articles. Right now we're a little slow because it's been over for about a year. It's tomorrow. Um, So we got writers and 
you know, we started posting more articles, we did giveaways, you know, very slowly but surely starting to put us out there. And then completely coincidentally, something really big happened <laughs> and we had this massive opportunity. So before the final season came out, it was like a really big deal. Uh, and the fandom was going absolutely feral. Like if you think <laughs> the Young Justice fandom is like feral for season four news right now, like, oh boy, every single day the fandom would be like tagging DreamWorks and be like, where is the trailer? Drop the trailer. And DreamWorks would be like, nothing <laughs> like they would provide nothing for weeks at a time so everyone was like super super hungry for like the first news of like season five and i don't remember if this came before or after the trailer on my timeline i want to say before but i'm not sure totally it was the beginning of quarantine you know everything was chill we were all getting to things i was sleeping until noon as one does because there was <laughs> nothing to do in quarantine and all of a sudden, one day I wake up and I have 25 messages on Discord from Melissa. Something happened. And I was like, this is a lot to wake up to at noon, but okay. So I read and then I go check our Twitter. And what had happened is that Melissa had signed us up for like a Netflix uh, news press, like type of email subscription for people. We were registered with Netflix press. And she had signed us up for that. And I had no idea at the time. And, you know, every month or so they send this type of email with like, here's what's coming to Netflix like next month. And she happened to click on the email one day and it took her to this like Google Doc full of like all this important press documentation for all these things that are coming out. And in this document just happened to be the first three screenshots from season three and like of five second clip and she was like well it's all official this was all through netflix so she was like she was obviously messaging me and i was asleep and she's like what do i do do i post it do i do it and finally she's just like you know what i'm just gonna do it so she posted <laughs> it and it blew up <laughs> like this was the first news like anyone had from season four and it was massive. like all of a sudden, like people were starting to take notice of us. We had like re retweets and like reshares and people commenting. Everyone was like, who are they? Like, how did they get this? How did, were they like leakers or something? And like even Noelle Stevenson, who is the showrunner for Shira, they were like, they, they start to take notice of us and they followed us, which was like a momentous moment in my life that I will never, ever forget. And we even got like afterwards, we had to field off like a couple of very uh, concerning emails from like DreamWorks PR. They were like, how did you get this uh, information? And we like sent them the email. We're like, this is all official. We got it through Netflix. Don't look at us. If you didn't want to release, look to them. We just did. what If it wasn't us, someone else would have broken it. But it happened to be us. And that is how uh, we got started. Wow. Yeah. No, that is amazing. That is a wonderfully chaotic story of yeah yeah <laughs> it is but you know i mean i wouldn't have had it any other way like i love the chaos the shira fandom is kind of chaos in all of the best ways so if i had to pick any other way i mean this was the way i would have preferred to have it so what have you all been doing just out of curiosity what have you all been doing now that the show's wrapped up to like <laughs> continue work on that show and keep it going and keep all that all that alive Great question. And the answer <laughs> is a lot of memes. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Fair like, enough. <laughs> we do. No, but we do like a lot of stuff. We post a lot of memes. We post tweets. We did articles for a while and we covered like any, we did interviews. We interviewed Noelle and Amy Carrero, uh, who is the voice of Shira slash Adora for the show. So that was going for a while. And then you know, things start to slow down a few months after the show ended, as tends to do. But the fandom didn't really die out for a while. So we, as long as people are still following us, we still made content. We stopped writing articles because everyone just got busy with life and as it is. But, you know, we honestly, with the year that we've had, we just tried to keep everything focused on being positive and like a wholesome community space where people can come to. And like, you know, just in all the chaos and madness of the world, you can look and see a cute cheer -a meme that'll make you happy or like an inspirational quote. Uh, for uh, holidays this year, we actually run ran a holiday card drive where I, I just had um, like a list, a Google Doc. And I was like, if anyone is feeling lonely this holiday and wants a holiday card, 
fill out this form with your information. I am buying all the cards myself and I will write them and I mailed it. And it was incredible. It was a lot of work. It took me like, I want to say two months to do it all. But like I wrote cards to every single person who wanted one. And it was so nice just to like, you know, be able to start someone's 2021 with like just a little bit of joy and spirit. Yeah, that's so nice. That's wonderful. I was going to say right now we're actually running a charity raffle because the one year finale anniversary is tomorrow. So I reached out to like a bunch of like Etsy sellers and fandom artists and they all were super generous and donated about 75 items for this wow. raffle. And we are raising money for about like six different organizations, including like the Trevor Project and uh, Comfort Cases and hashtag girls who migrate like a bunch of things that both the etsy sellers wanted because they wanted to pitch a few uh, organizations to include and stuff that aligns with the values of shira so we have like lgbtq plus uh, organizations that support them trans organizations just something to give a little back to this community as the year ended so that actually ends tomorrow and so far we've raised about six hundred dollars which is nice. I am hoping to get a little more before the day ends tomorrow. And so it be. That's so nice. By the time this comes out, this will sadly have already been <laughs> over. So no one will be able to go do this thing. But hopefully nope. people are seeing it on Twitter. Because uh, that sounds amazing. That is so, so amazing. To Using fandom for good is always is always a good thing in my brain. So aside from all of the wonderful online journalism and everything that you've been doing, I know that you've also been going to script writing classes uh, and applying to screenwriting fellowships. So would you mind talking about that a little bit? Yes. So for the past about year and a half now, I started to make this transition from literary writing to screenwriting, and it has literally taken over my life. Uh, <laughs> I realized, happens. yeah, it does. Uh, I realized that as much as I love reading, I kind of love watching things come alive on the screen just a little more. And there's something so magical about just seeing how words get interpreted off a screen into this bigger magical word world that, you know, especially in animation, which is such a criminally underrated medium, especially in like the Western hemisphere of the world. And the more that I became active in these communities for such well-written shows, the more that I knew that one day I wanted to create something that brings people together, that gets them excited and eager to see what comes next. So last year I started dabbling. I tried my hand at my first script. It was okay. You know, you thought, you think it's like, you know, amazing at the time. And then, you know, once you take like some constructive feedback and lessons, you're like, no, I know what I changed now. So uh, yes. <laughs> so right now I am entering into fellowship season for the second time and I don't really like doing things halfway. So I bit the bullet. I signed up for some screenwriting classes because it's cheaper than grad school. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, that especially in COVID, I was like, if I'm going to take online classes, then it's going to be this like, you know, couple and done rather than commit to a program with who knows what the world is going to look like. If I'm going to attend grad school, it's going to be in person yeah. with the connections with everything. So for now, like this is what I'm going to do. Yes. And uh, I getting that real time feedback, learning the fundamentals. And uh, because I'm me, I got addicted to the community aspect of it all. And, you know, I signed up for two more. So right now, I am taking three classes at the same time. I am working on three pilot scripts simultaneously, which is not recommended, but uh, I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> as as someone who has taken taken some playwriting classes in my time for my theater degree that I have that people know about, uh, yeah, the ju the jumping between different projects is always an adventure. But yeah, I'm sure you're doing amazing with all of those. Uh, do you want to talk about any of your pilots or are they super secret and on lockdown and you're not allowed to say anything about them? No, I'm an open book. I'm not hired anywhere. I could talk about whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, indeed. I have no, uh, what is it called? Uh, no contracts, no non-disclosure no forms. No, no NDAs. NDAs. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, so I'm writing three. One is an animated series called Bon Appetit. And it is about a prestigious cooking school that for the first time in forever opens its doors to children instead of adults. So it's a bunch of hilarious shenanigans about these little kids learning how to be chefs and getting caught up in a really crazy detailed world. So much fun. That sounds adorable. 
It is amazing. <laughs> I love it. That one is going into my, I'm working on my first draft of the script. That one is all ready to go. It should be done in a couple of weeks. And then we'll be brutally massacred by my fellow screenwriting compatriots, which <laughs> I look very much forward to. And then the two others that I'm working on is one is called Dear Miss Millie. It is a family friendly sitcom about a seventh grade boy who suddenly finds himself the secret voice behind an underground advice column, which is very wholesome. I really wanted to explore the dynamic between a very feminine expected position and switch that and put that into the hands of a 13 year old boy. Thought it would be a cool twist on things. And then the last one is called The Language House, which is actually very personal to me because it's based on a living learning program that I actually attended in college. And I woke up one day and I literally I thought about it and I was like, wait a minute, this is the perfect thing to put in a, as an environment for a show because no one has ever talked about it. This program doesn't even exist. I'm pretty sure in like 90 percent of colleges and universities. So <laughs> I'm going to write it because it's really chaotic and fun. So <laughs> it revolves around a girl and she has a lot of social anxiety, obviously someone else, not me, uh, who joins this unique and wacky dorm slash apartment community focused on learning foreign languages. And there are a lot of cool characters, interesting themes, learning how to make friends and to get past the trauma in your life. And this really super quirky, cool environment that is unique, I think, to my university in case I'm mistaken, which anyone can feel free to correct me. Do you have a language <laughs> house? I want to know. <laughs> All of those sound amazing. I cannot wait to see where they go. I hope they go somewhere. I hope I hope I get to voice something you write someday. That's that's a dream. I want to work on a project Ariel writes. <laughs> Putting that energy I, out to the world. Uh, you would be first on my list. We, we'll make it work. <laughs> someday, someday. <laughs> um, but I know you're also a uh, fanfic writer. So I was curious, how do you think your experience writing fic has helped or influenced your script writing? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of it boils down to being in a fandom because it allows me to see what is working for today's audiences. Like, wh what do people want to see from media today? What kind of themes and what kind of characters? And it's really eye-opening eye because a lot of showrunners they don't necessarily partake in fandom activity so they may not know like what the populace is looking for and i have been a part of so many fandoms for so many years and it's really refreshing to see oh wait here or what here what people want to see on the screen here are what tropes people don't really like anymore or want to like start being like removed from the world here are the tropes we do want to see and here are the types of identities that we want to see represented on the screen so i am able to take all of this information and use that in the stories that i'm writing and you know nothing of course is ever cut and dry there's always you know studios that you have to appeal to and like conventions of the screen and like you know networking but you know it's nice to have that little insight and tidbit of knowledge into these communities. But uh, in terms of my actual fiction, my fan fiction, I will say it is a fantastic experience for writing spec scripts where yeah, you I have to, that. yeah, where you have to emulate the voice of like a pre-established world. And it's really good practice to just, you know, focus on the characters and their development and their dialogue and take a step back. You know, you don't have to create your magical world with so many different details because it's already done for you. And all you have to do is write your own storylines and focus on the angst and drama and hurt comfort. <laughs> and for, for our listeners who might not know, who might not be familiar with all of the uh, entertainment industry lingo, a spec script is when you write a script, a proposed script for an existing show as kind of a way of showing like, see, I could write in this world and this is me fitting my voice and my writing ability into a pre-established uh, ongoing show. Like you'd use them to kind of apply for that writing team and for fellowships as a way of showing like, you can just slip me into your writing team and I'd fit right in. So it's just writing fanfic, but sort of professionally <laughs> as a portfolio in a script format. <laughs> It is exactly like writing fan fiction, except in, uh, you know, except on a, what's it called, final draft and tweaking a few things. But if you're good at, like, you know, dialogue and whatever, just, just you know, restructure your fan fiction. And uh, <laughs> who knows? Maybe one day you two will win a fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like you were saying, I think it definitely, I think one of the skills 
for this specific kind of writing that fan fiction gives you is learning how to mimic voices of characters, of just f- finding the ability of like, oh, I can watch a million hours of a TV show and know how this character talks and write dialogue that sounds like that character, <laughs> which not everybody can do. Uh, and it's no. an important skill when you're writing for an ongoing show. But uh, as... As a refresher for our audience to move on to more Young Justice specific topics, uh, when did you first see Young Justice? What, what, did you watch the original run or when it came out on DVD or Netflix or DC Universe, which is now an entire new era of people finding the show? <laughs> right? Uh, no, I was one of the OGs. I watched the original run, but a bit a very unorthodox experience. I am one of the only people that I know that started with Failsafe <laughs> as my first episode. Wild. That is a wild way to start the show. Right? Well, to be fair, I had to be sold on Young Justice because I was never a huge superhero girl. Like, growing up, I was way more into, like, the princesses and, like, the stereotypical, you know, girly type of TV shows. I was a very girly girl. And superheroes, aside from Teen Titans, because that was, you know, just brilliantly written, they were just not my jam. So I had this one. I feel that. Yeah. I had I this was, one. I was similar. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, I had this one friend and she was like, Ariel, you need to watch this show. You love pain and you love angst (laughs) and well-written stories. You have to watch. I was like, I don't know. Superheroes? Like, I don't know. It's not really my thing. This seems a little too much for me. And she's like, no, no, no. You don't understand. There was this one episode called Failsafe and everyone dies. It is a simulation. And there's this one girl, Artemis, and she... You know, she dies and it sets off this whole chain reaction. And there's this guy, Wally, who's like totally in love with her, but hasn't admitted it yet. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Okay. I'll give it a shot. Like after like a few days of begging me, I'm like, okay. So we started with failsafe and I I knew (laughs) it was a training simulation. I knew everything that had happened, but you know, that's, that's how we started. And then slowly we went back and then we started rewatching. We cherry picked episodes here and there. Like, I don't even think I watched like the first five episodes of Young Justice until like, I don't know, after I finished season one, I think I pretty much started with like <laughs> Artemis because that's what we did. We just cherry picked episodes. I remember one day we, it was like 8 a.m. too, when we were talking and she was like, I was like, Hey, what's episode 10 about? And she's like, oh, nothing. It's just, you know, Jade and then named Roy, like, stuff and and McGann and Connor. And I was like, excuse me? There was a Jade and Roy episode, (laughs) which at the time had been, like, my favorite couple. Because, you know, after you get into Young Justice, you start doing all this, like, comics research and lore research because you want to know all about these people. (laughs) So I was like... (laughs) What do you mean there's a Jade and Roy episode that we haven't watched yet? And you've been waiting until when to tell me this? <laughs> so that was our time in between. I think this was in between the hi- the first, actually, it may not even be the first, one of the hiatuses of Young Justice in between, like, uh, right before Misplaced aired. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah, then I watched, I watched everything else. As it aired, I watched. I remember when Misplaced aired because that was, and it has a very special place in my heart because that's the very first, you know, episode I've watched in tandem with the fandom at the time. And then after that, I remember when season two aired, like a week after season one. <laughs> I was there for all of that stuff, and then I came back, back when it was announced in 2016. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in Amsterdam at the time, and I remember <laughs> seeing this news, and I was like, oh my god. Yes, it is finally back. The, all of like, the, <laughs> all of the petitions worked. We're we're finally getting it back. And then you know we had to wait another like two three years <laughs> for it to uh, finally air. But it's been incredible. I'm I'm still recovering from the idea that your friend introduced this show to you with Ariel. You enjoy pain and <laughs> angst. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> Whatever it takes to, to sell somebody on a show, <laughs> that is hilarious to me. It's true, because if you tried to sell me the show, it's be like, oh, yeah, it's superhero kids having, like, a bunch of shenanigans and good times, because that's what season one is for a little bit. And then you're like, but wait a minute. No, there are secrets. There are lies. It is very well written. There is lots of secret pain and, like, teenage drama. And I'm like, okay, okay. No, tell me no more. I You sold me with the pain. I hear you. <laughs> 
I hear you. <laughs> Considering, like, I initially, I originally watched this show, the first episode, because nothing else was on. And then I accidentally fell in love. And now here we are uh, a decade later or however long it's been. <laughs> right. But no, that is <laughs> that is amazing. And it's especially hilarious to me that you watched Failsafe first because uh, I a while ago I was on another show and we were talking about uh, Young Justice and they were like, what do you think are some of the the best episodes? Like they were like, what do you think are the best episodes? And I they asked what the what order would you suggest somebody watch the show? And I was like, you got to watch it in, in order from the beginning. And I remember oh, yeah. explicitly mentioning because I was like, like, Failsafe is an amazing episode, but I'd never tell anybody to watch Failsafe first because like <laughs> Failsafe doesn't work without all the emotional buildup to get to Failsafe. And so hearing you be like, I watched Failsafe first <laughs> and then I was hooked is blows my theory completely out of the water, but is amazing and hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, something that I've noticed with Failsafe, especially now because it's almost 10 years. I looked this up because I was curious. It will be 10 years in uh, November uh, of, yeah, it came out in November of 2011. And I think it's, we've had so many shows pull like this quote unquote trope of it's all a dream. They didn't all, they're all fine in the end. Yeah. Because I showed two of my like very good friends, Young Justice for the first time during quarantine. And like, as soon as people started dying, like during Failsafe, they were like, okay, but this isn't real, right? Because there's like three seasons of this show. So they obviously don't all die, you know, at the end. So I'm glad I watched it when I did it. I'm glad everyone like in the original fandom, like watched it when they did without knowing anything, because as much as it pains me, I don't think it has like the same barons as it does now, like 10 years later, because yeah. you, you do know that there are three seasons and obviously these characters exist. So they're okay. They might be a little more traumatized, but they're fine. <laughs> But the thing that I do love about that episode that I do think still holds up is that Failsafe, unlike a lot of uh, It Was All Just a Dream episodes, has real consequences on the narrative. So true. it's not just used as kind of like a shock value. We thought you thought we killed everyone, but we didn't kind of episode. It's used as like a genuine character building and emotion driven part of that narrative. So for me, I'm like, that episode still holds up really well in that regard, even if you don't have the watching this on Friday night on Cartoon Network, oh my God, they're killing the whole cast of the <laughs> show vibe. Uh, it's, yeah, it's still a fantastic episode. And God, Donica McKellar's scream when she just screams Artemis, that lives rent free in my mind. I can picture it very clearly. It's God, it, it I, holds up. Yeah, I still like, I still have memories of like I remember watching that episode and I remember reacting to that episode as I was watching it for the first time 10 years ago like I don't have that for every Young Justice episode but that one my brain is like yeah I remember sitting on my couch and being vaguely traumatized as I were as I my brain continuously tried to rationalize what was happening I'm like they the, this what they can't they can't all be dead that's definitely they're just <laughs> transported oh they're not they're trans oh they're not transported What's happening? I'm concerned. <laughs> Big concern, that whole episode. Yeah. No, but the, the next episode is fantastic. How it addresses all of that. Yes, more of that. More shows with, with super-powered characters getting therapy. Yes, because that also, I mean, we had that in season three with Quiet Conversations and McGann, and that was a fantastic episode. More, more therapy, please. More therapy, more well-represented therapy, more actually useful therapy in superhero media. Big believer in that. <laughs> so speaking of the fact that there are three seasons and that there will be a fourth, when we started talking about what you might like to discuss on a return episode, we kept coming back to the idea of discussing some season four theories. And a lot of the theories people come up with for Young Justice are just deeply rooted in comic book lore and history, because this is a DC Universe show, and it's drawing on all of DC comics um, across the board. But that's not something you and I have a ton of experience with, uh, as we are willing and happy to admit. I do not know the entire DC Universe uh, backwards and forwards, even though I run a podcast about it. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> What we do have is some experience in storytelling. Uh, so you wanted to discuss some theories from a writing and foreshadowing perspective of approaching this of like, 
what blocks has Young Justice set up that they are setting up to knock down kind of thing. So, which I thought just sounded like a great idea. So let us jump in to some of those. Uh, So first off, I know you have a theory about why season four uh, subtitle is what it is, because as we we've heard already, we already know that season four is going to be called Phantoms, uh, the same way that season two is Invasion and season three is Outsiders. Season four will be called Phantoms. Uh, So I'm interested in hearing what your theory is about this. Yes. So I have a very basic theory. Like, forget the Phantom Zone, because what even is the Phantom Zone? I don't know. Let's pretend the comic book doesn't even exist. Uh, you know, going off what Brandon Vietti said that this season is going to focus on the core season one characters, which I'd like to imagine based on the Young Justice audio play will also include Will, Raquel, and Zatanna. I have a theory that is probably very, very wrong, that it is called Phantoms because it will focus on the phantoms that these characters have because i will say that almost all of them have some type of interpersonal phantom going and haunting them going into this season like for wally and uh, wally i'm (laughs) jumping ahead here (laughs) for artemis and dick it is wally uh they left him behind he is quote unquote dead or not dead no confirmation yet we'll get into that we'll get into that uh, so they have him, you know, Zatanna has her father who is still trapped in Dr. Fate and she's raising these protégés, you know, Will and Artemis both have Jade slash Treasure who is doing God knows what, God knows where. And we'll get into that. <laughs> uh, so then we have Calder who is haunted both by Tula and working under his father. And I'm sure his past is sitting just so well with him, even though we haven't really seen a lot of it in season three. But we can excuse that because there were literally 10 million things going on in season three at once. (laughs) And then, you know, we also, am I forgetting anyone other than Raquel? I hope not. (laughs) Because then we just have Raquel, who technically doesn't really have a phantom, but I would personally like to know who she's married to at this point. It's got to come up in season four, right? Who is Amistad's father? (laughs) <laughs> I'd like to know. <laughs> Is it noble from the comics? The one thing I do know from the comics. Hopefully season four will answer this. But yeah. So I... The things we know from the comics are who's dating who. And I feel like while that is both very stereotypical of us being <laughs> lady comic book fans, also this is what we're here for and i will not apologize for my nonsense i will uh, not apologize at all we we are here for the ships the dynamics the babies that come of those ships we are here for all of the interpersonal good stuff yes 100 <laughs> percent agree but yeah no i agree with you i think that could i think that could be an interesting thing and who knows titles may have multiple multiple meanings you know yeah i mean for all i know Young Justice Phantoms is going to be about the Phantom Zone or a secret co-op team called the Phantoms who <laughs> go around causing secrets and damage left and right. And my theory will be put into the dust, which it usually is, which can only attest to how good the writing is and how it surprises us every season with like something completely unexpected. Like we can theorize all we want, but like, you know, Greg and Brandon and the entire writing team have got like 10 million other things up their sleeves and who knows what this phantoms could mean. This is just, if I could imagine a scenario in which Young Justice Phantoms was written solely for my pleasure, I would want to go into the emotional traumas of these core season one characters and see how they deal with that. Or like, give us a whole season that is just introspective character study fanfics uh, and we will give you our (laughs) money. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) So moving uh, beyond the larger idea of what is phantoms to a specific phantom, I'm good at segues. Uh, <laughs> what is your personal theory about Wally? Do you think uh, do you think he's alive? Do you think Wally is dead? What do you th- what do you think? Yeah. Oh, he's he's definitely alive. <laughs> okay. We're just uh, so we're in the same camp. OK. Yeah. I mean, there's just too many like little scenes and lines of dialogue in season three that just bypass coincidence and like heavily tease that there's more to this story that they're letting on. Uh, I knew that they weren't going to bring him back in Outsiders. It was too obvious. They couldn't do it. It would have been far too soon. And in my opinion, from a storytelling perspective, if they had brought him back in season three, it would have rendered his sacrifice in season two as like a little cheap. Because like, yeah, superheroes come back all the time. I know for us, this was something that like me, Rich, and Neil talked about uh, a lot when that episode 
first happened and we were talking about it. Um, and we, when we did so, uh, something for DC Daily before we had uh, started recording and we were all just on, uh, and I was on the call for that and we were just kind of chatting with the host, Hector Navarro had asked us, he was like, do you guys think Wally's alive or do you think Wally's dead? And all three of us immediately were like, oh, Wally's definitely alive. And he's like, really? Why? Why do you think? Like, he was like, <laughs> why are you so sure kind of thing? And my thing was, it's like, my reason for thinking Wally is alive has nothing to do with comic book lore and has nothing to do with the speed force or yep. anything like that, but is purely like we're talking about based on storytelling conventions. Because like when that episode started and when they started going through that whole uh, Artemis processing her grief and everything, I was like, oh, I guess I guess this is our real goodbye to Wally. I guess Wally's dead. And then when it got to the very end and Zatanna and McGann's plan comes out and Zatanna's like, yeah, no, that wasn't Wally. I can't bring back the dead. I can't do that. None of this was any, no ghosts. <laughs> uh, my immediate thought was, oh, Wally's not dead then. Uh, because the best way to cause some actual meaningful drama later in the show would be to reveal that Wally's not dead. Because after that whole thing of Artemis like, okay, I finally let this go and accepted this to have Wally come back. Now that has meaning and now that has narrative weight to it uh, rather than him just coming back. Yeah, from my perspective, if we're looking at just season three, there are so many little instances that kind of tease, like, is he or isn't he? I was, like, on the fence the whole season because, on one hand, you know, we have Artemis and Dick, who are both at, like, dramatically different stages of their grieving process. Like, yes. Artemis is nearing the end of her acceptance phase, you know? She can look at a picture of Wally without, like, bursting into tears, and she can talk about him with Dick after his, like, traumatic flashback and, you know, not completely break down. And then Dick is, like, still stuck somewhere in the middle of this cycle, you know? He's calling <laughs> Will Wally. <laughs> he's having flashbacks. He still hasn't really accepted that his friend's friend is gone, you know? But we get so many scenes of them inching closer to accepting the truth that he's gone. And, you know, then you have that whole... <laughs> thing with uh, the mind world with Artemis where she sees Wally and on the surface level it does look like closure because you know she's like oh you're really dead aren't you and you know we get that whole traumatic beautiful like goodbye scene with the music where she steps out the door and it's like okay goodbye Wally but then you know going rewinding for a second because she goes so you're really dead aren't you and then he goes hey let's not think about that and this isn't the first time that this has happened. It also happens in Nightmare Monkeys, where, you know, Garfield is aboard the ship and Hollow Wally and him watch as, you know, <laughs> the other dead characters get zapped into oblivion. You know, Tula, Ted Cord, and Jason are suddenly gone. And Wally goes, huh, well, it's a good thing they were already dead, you know, <laughs> and that's never addressed, <laughs> you know. So it is he dead? Or isn't he? If he was dead, wouldn't we get a final confirmation of like, yes, Wally is dead. And if, you know, this whole mind space that was Zatanna and McGann's doing, if they really wanted to give Artemis closure because they were making up this whole thing, wouldn't they have told Artemis? Like when she asked, couldn't they have told the answer? Yes, I'm dead. Please move on. Not in those words exactly, but like, <laughs> you know, close the book on that. But Episodes the book is 10 times closed. shorter. <laughs> It's yes, I mean, Wally obviously, saying, with I'm all dead, of please move on, walk out this door. We're not just go, go, go. I mean, not exactly. You could be like, yes, I'm dead, but we have until morning. So let's imagine what our dream life could have looked like. You know, I'll give you like, you know, 10 more minutes of like, you know, heart eyes. We can kiss a couple more times. It's fine. We got until morning, you know, but <laughs> there is no like verbal confirmation at any point during the series. And going off of what you said, I think that is a brilliant way. And if Wally comes back next season, Artemis is going to get super mad at Zatanna and McGann because we understand that she was trying to help her friend. But at the same time, it's kind of messed up of them to do, especially if he's not dead. Especially in a season where the ending 
we all learned a lesson was let's not keep big secrets from each other. It causes <laughs> rifts in various teams. And now everyone's like, you're right. You're right. No more anti-light. No more secret teams. But no one tells Artemis, hey, you know that, you know that mental playground simulation that helped you get over the loss of your dead boyfriend? We made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. This is so in character. I feel like every season, the theme of Young Justice is don't tell secrets. <laughs> don't keep lies. Do they ever learn this lesson? No. <laughs> it's the one lesson. Young, like Young Justice is very good at character development and people learning and growing. But when this show was pitched as a show about secrets and lies, it means that every <laughs> season... At least a couple people who should probably know better are going to not tell people something important. Uh, and I'm fine with that. It's good. It's the way people are sometimes. Sometimes we don't learn. Look, I mean, but. yeah, it's it's all totally understandable. Like, the anti-light, completely logical. Totally get where you're coming from. But at the same time, if we open season four and I see another, like, secret meeting where Calder, <laughs> McGann, and Dick are all there, I will not be surprised. I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, here we go again. <laughs> it's just going to be McGann being like, but we include Superboy this time. <laughs> Can we include, maybe then he won't be mad at me this time. And Artemis, can we like include her? <laughs> She's missing it after season two. The reason season four is going to focus on the original team is clearly <laughs> because it's they've all formed a new secret team <laughs> from the rest of the team. <laughs> it's the Mentors Alliance. <laughs> It's like, hey, guys, oh you know, the outsiders got their thing. The team has their thing. Let's form a secret team of our own and go on our own super secret espionage missions. I like that. Who's in? It's just like old times, blowing up buildings, <laughs> having mental <laughs> memes with each other. <laughs> Pretending you know. to be a covert op team. There we go. That's the one I was waiting for. Uh, Ooh. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Conclude part one. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.